Would you stand with me for scripture reading? Our text comes from Romans chapter 4. And I'm, be, I'm going to be focusing on verses 4 to 5. But uh, to give us a little bit of context, I'm going to read through uh, verse 1 to 8. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, I'm Peter. Um, and uh, I'm, 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 I'm just a pinch hitter for, for Tim. And I'm, I'm just... I'm just thankful that, that you invited me back. Well, thank you for inviting me back. I, it's not a guarantee thing. I realize that. And I don't take that for granted. And I was, I was really encouraged and really just uh, overwhelmed by, by the support uh, from Grace. You know, after all these years of, of speaking and preaching to young people, I'm just surprised that, that, that there are people who have the attention to stay with me <laughs> for, uh, for more than five minutes. I, I, was, I was not used to that. But anyway, uh, last week, we began and end with Alastair McIntyre's uh, quote. He says, I cannot answer the question, what ought I to do, unless I first answer the question, of which story am I to part? And I ask the question, of which story are you a part? Now, Suppose we know which story we belong to. And while we edit, let's say that we even know what ought we to do. Uh, what ought we to do? I'm thinking that's still not the same as actually doing it. Right? I mean, real heart level life transformation doesn't happen just because we want to. In my experience, I have never been able to, to will to will myself into a different, better version of me. Not really. Okay? Not really. So what am I missing? Well, that's something that God has been showing me in what I call the second significant movement in my faith journey, and that's what I want to share with you, and I hope that it does resonate with you. Let's begin with the foundation, though. In Philip Yancey's book, What's So Amazing About Grace, he described in, in an argument between scholars on the uniqueness of Christianity. Some said that it was the incarnation. Others said that it was the resurrection. But when C.S. Lewis, when he happened onto the debate, he said, oh, that's easy. It's grace. You know, I think he hit the nail on the head. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Right. Understand this. Every other religion or philosophy, every religion, every philosophy says this. Man must bring his righteousness to God. That's right. Only in Christianity, the Bible tells us that we must receive righteousness from God. See the difference? That's the idea of grace. That's the gospel. There's nothing that I can do to earn God's favor. I have no righteousness of my own to bring to him. And the only thing I can do is to, is to receive. To receive God's righteousness freely. 
the reformers called this sola gratia, grace alone, grace alone. Now, I heard this for the first time when I was about 16 or 17 years old. I, I kind of uh, share that story with you. To this day, it's still the most amazing and the most profound idea that I've known. But the concept of grace, I believe, really runs against the grain of human nature, so much so that my immediate reaction to all of that was, okay, if this is really true, then doesn't it follow that I can do whatever I want as a Christian. Jesus paid it all. Right? And if I can't do whatever I want, then how can it be genuine grace? But, but surely my good works must be part of the equation somehow. Surely God cares about his people being good. Right? So how can we resolve that tension between grace alone and a place of good works? Well, the answer to this is really, really not all that complicated theologically. Uh, the Reformers said this, and I agree completely. I forgot whether it's Luther or Calvin, but the Reformers said this. Faith alone justifies, but not the faith. That is alone. I want you to take a moment to think about that. Faith alone justifies. Faith alone. But not the faith. That is alone. In the Bible, the idea of good works is always a byproduct. It's a fruit of faith. It's never where we begin. It's never a condition for God's love. It's not even something that's there to shame us or to guilt trip us. The starting point is always grace alone and faith alone. But faith does produce fruits. Pretty straightforward, right? Well, not so much, I found out. Not so much in everyday life, though. Can I be honest? Can I be honest? The Christian church in general... It's caught between easy believism where our pews are filled with people who behaves badly. And legalism. Legalism, where Christians have gained the reputation for being sanctimonious or self-righteous. There's no denying that organized religion has become a dirty word in our culture. So here's the problem. The Bible clearly sets a high, high moral standard. But we see many Christians, including me, falling way short of that. So what do we do? Well, our intuitive approach. This is our intuitive approach. Our intuitive approach is this. We go back to the drawing board and we put more emphasis on good good Christian behavior. We promote again and again the discipline of Christian living. And then we intensify the accountability aspect of godly living. Sometimes, sometimes we actually resort to concrete rules and external standards to measure, to measure holiness. All in hopes that somehow we'll begin to transform lives. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not against any of these things. I'm not saying that these are unimportant or they are bad in and of themselves. But in the book of Romans, in the letter to the Romans, I find Paul take a very different, and a very counterintuitive approach. He does talk about Christian moral behavior, to be short. Think about chapter 12. Chapter 12, love must be sincere. Hey, what is evil? Cling to what is good and don't take revenge. Chapter 13, submit to governing authorities. Chapter 14, accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment. Chapter 15, We who are strong ought to bear the failings of the weak. Paul will eventually get to all these good works. But that's not where he starts. He starts with chapter 1. The wrath of God and human wickedness. Chapter 2 and 3. God's righteous judgment in our sin. There's no one righteous, he says. Chapter 4. Justification by faith alone. 
Chapter 5 and 6, we're no longer under law, but under grace. Chapter 8, we receive the spirit of sonship. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father. And towards the end of the chapter, he described this incredible sense of freedom and confidence. Who is he that condemns? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then chapter 9 talks about God's sovereign election. God chooses not because of who we are and, and, and what we do, but because he wants to. Right. Period. Amen. And then chapter 12, where it's begin to talk about Christian living. He says this, therefore. Well, that's a very important word yeah. because it, yeah. it, it connects to whatever comes before. In view of God's mercy, right? In view. In other words, what, 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 when Paul was writing the church, he, he, hasn't, he hadn't visited, he was not familiar with. What he did first and foremost was to make sure that they actually have the same understanding of the gospel as he does. So he actually made sure that they see the full extension of these two lines. Now, this is, by the way, um, every single of my students know this, and they have it memorized by heart. This is, by the way, the Call the Close Shot from Gospel Center Life Curriculum. It is put out by New Growth Press, I believe. Uh, and this is the, the Gospel Chart, which I find help, just tremendously helpful. Now, you notice that this is, a, this is a time right here. So the point where we become saved is when we become aware there's a gap between God's holiness and my sinfulness, my brokenness. Now, something then strange happens, okay? So as you move on, as you grow more and more mature, something very strange happens. You actually feel like that you're less and less righteous. Now, you're not becoming less and less righteous as a Christian, but you become more and more aware of your own brokenness. You become more and more aware of God's holiness. Now, but instead of doing this, by the way, if, if, you, if you follow this, and we don't do this perfectly, this is what often what happens in church. What we do is we fill the space up, the screen space up, with a kind of self-deception, which is, you know, I'm not that bad. That was, I mean, oh, okay, I made a mistake, but that wasn't really me. Or we, 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 uh, we began to, to pretend. And now up here, we fill the screen space with self-justification, the idea that, you know, I am actually performing a lot of God's, God's demands. Maybe God, God's holiness is not all that, more, all that difficult. I mean, it's something that certainly... You know, I can, I can meet those standards. And as you begin to do that, notice what happens is that actually the cross gets smaller or it stays the same. Okay? You see, Paul knows that the size of the cross, meaning our perception of God's love, is a function of how much we grasp the reality of the upper line and the lower line. When the Holy Spirit helps us see the reality within, then we begin to encounter how deeply God actually loves us. That's represented by the size of the cross, right? And how truly great is the grace of God. And then and only then our theology will translate into real transformation without. In other words, if a Christian behaves badly, his or her problem is not that he or she doesn't know the standard of right and wrong. Often he does and it makes no difference. The real problem may be this. There is no real grasping or the real first-hand, heart-level experience of the grace of God and love of God. Now, the amazing thing about the book of Romans is this. Ultimately, we arrived at the nitty-gritty of Christian living, of Christian good works. But it's the very essence of the gospel that brings us there, which is grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. Not faith plus good works. Amen. Now, let me say this. This is not easy. It isn't easy. It's not easy because it encounters human nature, which is all about performance and image. You know, I had a hard time just uh, with the Chinese church. I, I was serving there uh, for 20-something years, and the last church I was there, 17. I had a hard time getting the Chinese Christians to move their understanding of the gospel from their heads to their hearts. But then, when Carson was born in 2012, 
all of a sudden I realized that, you know, I should have looked in the mirror, okay? <laughs> I was all about performance. I am all about performance and image, in spite of all these years of teaching and preaching the gospel. Romans 4. I'm going to uh, take you to Romans 4, verses 4 to 5. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as is due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Now, this was part of the text for my message on the Sunday right before Nita gave birth, 2012. Now, I don't know this, if this ever happened to Tim, but I... But I bombed that message, and I feel really depressed. <laughs> you know, it's one thing to feel depressed because I, I wondered what the God understood, right? But no, I, I was depressed. Looking back, I was depressed because I, I, I performed poorly. Well, then on Monday, the day after that, September, September the 10th, and I had this all written down, so that's why it's, it's all here. Anita's uh, uh, contractions they were becoming more and more regular. And then that same afternoon, her parents came over to have dinner with us, so we went out to eat, and I brought my iPad, and uh, I downloaded a little app to keep tracks of Nita's contractions. Yes, they said app for that. <laughs> By the end of dinner, Anita's contraction was getting stronger and closer together. Still, we, we, we weren't sure. We weren't sure if she was really going to labor, but we sent Caleb with my in-laws just in case. About 8 o'clock, we called the doctor, and because the baby was breached and we knew this, the doctor, she, she wanted us to go to the hospital for a C-section. Now, when we got to Paoli Hospital around 9 o'clock, the doctor could feel the baby's feet in, in the birth canal, and everybody immediately shifted to emergency mode. Apparently, C-section is not a good idea once the baby is in the birth canal. Now, Anita's water wasn't broken yet, so um, there's still some time. But within five minutes, Anita was on the operating table. And I was seated uh, at the head of the table with her and completely covered in scrubs from head to toe. The doctor actually offered me, she says, she said, would you like to, to watch? I said, no, thank you. I, I'm pretty good where I am. So what, what she did is she, she, put, uh, she put a blanket uh, between me and, uh, and Anita's stomach. And, uh, but I, I, I was holding Anita's hand, and that's how we went through the operation. At exactly 10 o'clock, Carson was born. We could hear the doctor and nurses working on him, but we couldn't see him. And after about five to 10 minutes, a nurse came over and knelt down. She just knelt down. I was seated, seated and I... I, I I remember this for the rest of my life. She knelt down next to me, and then she put her hands around my shoulder, on my back, and she said this. She says, congratulations, mom and dad. You have a beautiful baby. We're still working on him, but, but, we think he probably has Down syndrome. When the news hit us, it, it, it was really difficult to describe what, what I felt like. I didn't know what I was. I, I never had that experience, but I was in shock. And I think, I think to describe it, I think I came face to face with my unspoken assumptions about the babies, assumptions that I didn't know I had. I had assumed Carson would be just like a combination of Anita and me. That he would, grow up, he, would, he would grow up to love C.S. Lewis, like both of us do, play varsity sports like me, finish UPenn and seminary in record time like Anita, <laughs> and become world-class theologian like D.A. Carson, for whom he was named. So in spite of the fact that we were both ministers of the gospel, Anita and I had sub-gospel expectations about our baby's appearance and his abilities. And in the next couple of days, as we went through the process of just digesting what all of this meant, it became more and more clear that what it meant was, was this, that the gospel is not an idea for my head. It is a story I must live. 
Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. Our world is entrenched in performance and image. Even in the case of family, the one place where there shouldn't be this culture of performance and image, we can't quite separate our love from our expectations. Now, let me give you some example from the Asian community. By the way, I, I know I look exactly like Tim, but I'm actually fully Asian, okay? <laughs> and when it comes to ethnic humor, remember, I'm highly trained professional. Don't, please don't do this at home. <laughs> don't try this at home. So around 2012, there was a whole bunch of memes in the Asian community that began to appear online. And so we, we often joke within our own circles. And this is, this is the high expectation Asian dads. This is somebody from the Korean drama, some actor. So she, he, plays, he always plays this dad who has high expectation. He says, Asians, not Bijans. Now this is all about <laughs> academics, okay? <laughs> you listen to Beyonce. He says, why no Aonce <laughs> to be or not to be? Not to be, to A. <laughs> now, understand there's no plural forms, okay, in, in, in Chinese. And lastly, Asian with no A's, sin. You get it? Okay. And then we have high, expe high expectation tiger mom. Yale is okay for safety school. <laughs> you want second place? Second place is the first place for losers. <laughs> if you have time to Facebook, you have time to practice. We're talking about piano, violin, four more hours. <laughs> and lastly, you can be, you can be anything you want, doctor or lawyer. <laughs> Now, this is, the next is a commercial. It's an actual commercial that I, that, that as we travel back to Asia, uh, this is actually something that I saw in the newspaper in Taiwan. This is for plastic surgery, okay? So, mom and dad, they had, they, they, they gone to the, the knife, so they had this, they, they, they look like a mail-in box. But their kids, not so much. So, the caption says this. The caption says, the only thing you need to worry about is how to explain it to your kids. Is that terrible? <laughs> but the world is about performance and image. So all of this is not just ethnic humor. It's, it, I'm going somewhere with this. It is all about performance and image. But at the heart of the gospel is grace. And that counters our culture and our human nature in the most profound way. There's nothing we can do to earn God's favor. We have no righteousness of our own to bring to him. The only thing we can do is to receive God's righteousness, not our righteousness, but God's righteousness freely. That's sola gratia, grace alone. Amen. Now, this is so different from anything else that we've known, that even after it's explained to us, our reaction is, that's great, but that cannot mean what I think it means. God's grace is a brilliant idea. Right? But it cannot be completely free. There must be a string attached somewhere. We don't say it, but we kind of, we, we intuitively kind of act like it. Right? God gives grace to be sure. Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to, to think about this. Is this, is this how we feel? God, grace, God gives grace to be sure, but he gives grace to the right kind of people, to nice people, to good people, or to people with a good heart. But look at what Paul says, Romans 4, verse 5. Right? To the one who works, his wages are not counted as gift, but as due. And verse 5, to the one who does not work, but believes in him, meaning God, who justifies the ungodly. Now, brothers and sisters, have you been justified? Yes. So what kind of people were you? Ungodly. Ungodly. Now, you know, Paul, as a Jew, this could not be, he could not say something more awkward about God. This is a very shocking and very bold assertion. God is the one who justifies the ungodly. 
That just, I mean, that's, that runs against the grain of Jewish mind. Notice the contrast also be, between gift, and that's a, that's a word for grace in Greek, and his due, and that's a word for debt in Greek. Notice the contrast. What it's saying is this. If the gospel requires our good works in any form, then God is not giving us grace. He's giving us our wages, which is obligated to give. Grace and debt, they don't mix. And if the gospel is about God's grace, then the result is sola fide, faith alone. We can only receive God's grace by faith and by faith alone. In other words, grace excludes the idea of works. And what is left is faith, which is not, which is not another kind of work. It's simply a response, by the way, to grace. It is the two sides of the same thing in the gospel. On the one side is grace, the response is faith. It's not, faith is not another kind of good works. And then Paul demonstrates this. What he did is he, he kind of, he brings up the story of Abraham. And then he demonstrates this in two parts. First in verses 4 to 5, he's making the point that the gracious act of God who justifies the ungodly, that eliminates any place for works in the process. And then secondly, in verses 6 and 8, 6 to 8, Paul will add another confirmation from the Old Testament, which explain the same idea, but now in terms of forgiveness. So ultimately, the idea of faith alone means that our good works has no place in our standing before God. The gospel of grace insists on this. And again and again, Paul says that there is no other way. So Romans 3.28, he says, For we hope that one is justified by faith apart, apart from the works of the law. But that is the opposite of the rest of the world. In fact, the gospel is so diametrically different from our culture that we can't help but mix this idea of grace and works. And even after the gospel is ex ex explained to us, in a way, you know, we, we, we still can't help all parents, including Anita and me, we are more or less motivated by a certain vision of hope of what our baby will become. We have this impure motive that is a mixture of love and expectations. And this is very much part of our nature in our world, even if it's unspoken. So what happened when Carson was born was this, that God put Anita and me in that situation where it's either all, it's either all gospel or nothing. See, now we know that for any parents, once the baby was born, you don't get to say, wait, let me see what he is going to grow up to be, right? Let me get in a time machine and see the future, and then I'll figure it out whether or not I want this baby. You don't get to decide. Right? That's just the way God works this out. So he's teaching us. You don't get to decide whether you want to be his parents based on any performance or image. But even then, though, even then, though, part of our human nature is that we still hope, we still dream. And I do, in fact, hope and dream. And all of that was exposed when I got the news that my baby has Down syndrome. And in an instant, my unspoken hope or dream is taken away. And I was left with just how much, how much you really know about love. So in a way, God purged. He purged our expectations so that it's no longer about what a baby will do, what a baby will become, what a parent's dream and hopes about him may be, but whether or not we will be able to love him as God loves. But isn't that the gospel? That's the gospel, isn't it? You know, the first night I stay at the hospital until about 1.30 in the morning. I'm, 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 I was in shock. I was still in shock. And I was trying to process all of this. And on the way home, yes, I left Anita on the way home. I was driving and, and I was passing uh, one, of the, one of the traffic lights. And there, uh, I experienced something. Now, I don't, I don't, I don't have, the, this, this doesn't happen to me very often. Now, I, I don't want to downplay this idea of, of, you know, I heard God spoken to me. 
And I don't want to downplay that all the times that we hear from God in his word. I don't want to kind of elevate this, but at the same time, there's something very different that day. I heard these words, even though they're not a voice, it's not audible, but it appears in my mind so immediately and directly, and I know it came from God. It says this, it's Peter, you're so deeply loved. Now, the, the reason why, uh, you know, I hesitate a little bit, because all, whenever God speaks to us, it came through the same frequency as everything else. And you got to kind of, kind of step back and, and wonder. Now, this time, Peter, you, you're so deeply loved. And I was like, I don't get it. I don't see any reason that I am so deeply loved. So I didn't, I didn't get the logic. So that's when I, when I heard and felt that, then I realized that it does, it's not connected with all of my experiences at the same time. So I was just kind of baffled. Well, God will show me why that is in the next couple of days. Now, I understand, in spite of the shock, we never felt unlucky. Instead, of, we do feel a deep sense of calling. God called us to be Carson's parents and called Carson to teach us about love and about grace. But, you know, I had a lot of learning to do. Next morning, I got up at 6.30 in the morning. I prayed and I wept. I wept because I, I thought about how unfair life would be. Not just for me as parents, but for Carson. Just how people would look at him differently. I thought about how difficult Anita in my life would be as parents. We don't even know. Like, there's a lot of unknowns there. Then lastly, I wept because I realized how spiritually impoverished I was. See, the, the learning curve was steep on the cross chart, if you can. Yes. <laughs> I began to realize that, wow, I, I, didn't, I didn't get all of that. And to help me see those two lines, the upper line and the lower line, God gave me two stories in the next couple of days. On those first couple of nights at the hospital and home, I read as much as I could about Down syndrome. I know that some parents, their first reaction is to kind of push everything away. I, I'm, I'm a little bit different. I, I, I want to know. So I read as much as I could about Down syndrome. In that process, I came across a small news blurb, a little story about the case of Ariel and Deborah Levy. In March 2012, that's the year that Carson was born, just um, a few months before, this couple from Oregon, they received a, a $2.9 million settlement because their doctor had failed to diagnose Down syndrome during their prenatal test. And this is what they say through the lawyer. We, we, we love our little girl very, very much. But we would have terminated the pregnancy had we known that she had Down syndrome. Now, I was reading that, and I felt indignant. I felt indignant. Really? Really? Is that what you, how are you going to explain that to your girl? We love you, but we would have aborted you if we knew that you had DS. And since we didn't know, so we sued the pants of the doctor, you can have the oldest money. I mean, how, how, how is that conversation? So as a father of a baby with Down syndrome, I feel very indignant about what they have done. Nita and I, I thought, we would never have done anything like that. Then I came across the second story. See, this is, not, this is just a process. I came across a second story, a story of Andrea Roberts, who founded Reese's Rainbows a decade ago. It's a ministry that matches orphans with Down syndrome around the world with American parents. Her experience as a mother of a child with Down syndrome has led to this ministry, which facilitated the adoptions of hundreds and hundreds of children from around the globe who would have otherwise been left to die in orphanages and has extended to other children of special need, not just Down syndrome now. And through that ministry, a pastor from Maryland by the name of Andy Nagel and his wife Bethany, they had their family of their own. They didn't have to do this. His children were grown, but they decided to bring home a young boy, not even a baby, but a young boy with Down syndrome from Eastern Europe and call him their son. Now, understand as I was... As much as Anita and I have grown in the last few years, and as much as we love Carson, I'm not sure I would have chosen a child 
with Down syndrome if it were up to me. So I may look at the couple from Oregon, and we, I can proclaim self-righteousness. I self-righteously, I am more loved than you. But, right, but God showed me through Andy and Bethany Nego that the upper line and the lower line of the cross chart, that his standard was higher than I, than I had ever thought. His standard was higher, his holier than I had ever imagined, and I was much more broken than I had realized. You see, it took a couple of days, but it finally dawned on me. It dawned on me that what I had a hard time doing with Carson was exactly what God had done with me. Now, what do you mean? You see, in my natural state, I was born into the orphanage of sin, left to die. In fact, I was born with this defect many, many times worse and more serious than Down syndrome. But God in Christ has chosen me. And Romans tells me he has adopted me into his family, not according to who I am or what I do, or what I can do and will do, but according to his love. So we look at children with DS and we say, wow, I'm, at least I'm not like that. I'm glad I wasn't like that. Or that's, that's too bad. I would have never chosen to have babies with defect if it were up to me. Or I can't imagine what it's like to be a parent of DS baby, or just be a person of Down syndrome. But what I've forgotten is this, that all of us were born with this terrible problem called sin. In comparison, Down syndrome is trivial. We may not have intellectual delay. We may not have motor skill delay, but we have a spiritual delay. And one of the first days as we talked to a geneticist, she emphasized to us as, peop- as parents who are uh, raising kids with special needs, she says, you know, Carson is going to be able to do a lot of things, more than you think. But he's going to need a lot of repetitions. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Something that took a child four times, maybe it's going to take him 50 times. But I'm thinking, how many times does God have to teach me a lesson of patience? <laughs> do we not have a spiritual delay? In fact, I was born spiritually dead, the Bible says, which has a much more profound impact on everything else. And in spite of that, God had loved me, and he had chosen me, and he found a way in Christ to adopt me and redeem me, having nothing to do with my abilities or how cute I was. (laughs) That's the gospel. And I heard the Lord says, Peter, you're so deeply loved. Do you feel that way? Is that your story? We, we go back one to the, to the, yes. Is that your story? Or are you living the next one, the shrinking cross chart? Are you living that? Let's pray together. Father, you are holier than we had ever imagined. We cannot even come to understanding what that is like. And we are more broken than we had realized. May that be the reality that we experience on a daily basis. So that on a daily basis, we come face to face, we encounter, we grasp, we experience how deeply your love is for us on the cross. May the size of the cross may that may the size of your love for us ever be the boundless sea, the ever be beyond our imaginations. Father, we pray that the Spirit will convict us of these realities. And to the degree that we understand these realities, we see that to that degree and that degree only, help us also to love. Not the way we do, but the way that you do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.